said, you know, there's something that really bothers me. What's that? I got a guy down the street that owes me 500 bucks and he won't acknowledge it. And so I don't know how to uh, break it to him that I want it right now. He said, I got an idea for you. Why don't you write him a letter and say, uh, what are you going to do about my $5,000? And <laughs> at that point, he'll write you back and say, I only owe you 500. Now you have proof. <laughs> We got some good uh, visitors here today. Wayne Bland, stand up and introduce your wife. <laughs> and did your buddy Jonathan come? All right, Jonathan Berry. Jonathan Berry. Is a commercial banker with PNC Bank. And uh, he's a great friend of uh, our family. Um, he's also a great friend of Dr. Kelly's. He wanted to come hear him speak today. Uh, Jonathan's a really good dad, too. In his spare time, he's a stand-up comedian. So maybe we'll have a, an event where Jonathan can, can entertain us. Jonathan, we didn't know he had any friends. Poe, hi. Stand up, uh, bring the, the mic over to her, and she can tell us a little bit about what she's planning and doing, what she's doing here, and what may happen. Yeah, I, I'm, I like to introduce to myself. My name is Po Piu. I'm from Myanmar. And then in Myanmar, we have uh, six Rotary Clubs there. So I'm from one of the Rotary Club. Rotary Club of Metro Yangon, Charter President. We formed it, Charter 2020, July 4th. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Her name is Poe, P-O-E. Welcome, Rotarian. Let's see, um, Rodney, you got a couple of good guys here today, buddy. Yeah, I just want to give some more love to Madam President uh, Poe. Thank you for coming to see us. Can we give her a round of applause for being here with us? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. There's a lot of interesting things happening around the world that we're blessed to not have to deal with, but some of us see it, so um, it's tough. But I would like to introduce some amazing people that I brought here for you today. One of them is an actor. We'll bring him up first to introduce himself and tell you what he is doing here in Colorado Springs. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Calvin Thompson. I'm an LA-based actor, and I'm in town as a special guest uh, artist with the End Center of the Arts. We're doing The Bluest Eye, a uh, book by Toni Morrison, adapted by Lydia Diamond, and it's directed by uh, Lynn Hastings. We go up April 21st, and we go until May 20th. We would love to have you out. It's a beautiful story. Uh, it shall move the community. I love the Colorado Springs community, and uh, we would love to have you. It's at the Ent Center of the Arts. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right, next up I have, come on, brother. Hey, Calvin. Yeah. Uh, I want to tell Calvin, uh, me and my wife have tickets to that, so we're going to be going backstage. <laughs> <laughs> man. Sean Collins. Yep, it's Mike. Sir. All right, I'm extremely nervous, um, which I don't usually get nervous. I put together like a 30 second commercial and haven't memorized it yet, but I figured why not give it a spin here? You guys be honest with me about it. So my name is Sean Collins, a CEO and founder of a digital advertising agency called Parrot. Recently, we gave birth to a new sales and marketing platform called Sales Cake. Basically, Sales Cake helps business owners to know the value of digital marketing, uh, but they may not have the budget to hire a large advertising agency like Parrot. So simply put, we show business owners how to use their sweat equity to increase their company's bottom line. So if you want to learn more about digital sales and marketing without the high market cost, please reach out to us. The sales process, piece of cake. Thank you. Thank you. 
Would all of you who didn't know what digital marketing is and was, raise your hand. <laughs> He's the man to talk to. <laughs> now this uh, next guy I've known for a long time, like 55 years. Uh, this is my son, Scott. Uh, he's right over there, and uh, he'll tell you what is going on with him. He has provided me with a couple of great-grandsons, uh, a couple of grandsons, no great-grandsons yet, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but they're great guys. <laughs> Where are you from, bud? I'm, my name is Scott Ormond. I'm from Aspen, Colorado, down uh, visiting my dad, uh, having a good time with him. He's the handsome one in the family. I'm the smart one. <laughs> there, there are no, no genetics in question there. Um, so two things. Um, one is Poe is going to be our speaker um, at the end of this month when we are meeting at the Pinery. Um, for our meeting, for our weekly meeting, and she's going to be telling us about her Rotary Club um, there in Myanmar. So thank you. Yeah. And then I had a question for you. Is John Cusick also going to be in that movie that you're doing? No? Okay. Um, all right. So um, next we have our community service update, and Samantha couldn't be here today, but I did print out what she sent um, about community service. And um, um, she wanted to say thank you to those who provided donations to One Nation Walking Together. I will have a total number or total number of what I will have a total number of numbers donated shortly. Okay, she's gonna she's gonna figure that one out. Um, later this month, we'll have our second memorial tree planting in honor of those Rotarians who passed in 2021. Scott Beller, Rhea Woltman, and Buzz Rieger. So as many of you as want to um, come and be part of that, um, you won't have to dig. Harding's Nursery will be doing all of the heavy work, but um, but if you wanted to come be part of that, um, that would that would be great. And then um, Friday, let's see. Okay, so that's Friday, April 22nd at Millibo Art Theater. And then afterwards, it's gonna be at three o'clock, then we're going to be doing a garden cleanup there in the Millibo Art Theater um, garden area. Um, let's see, in other news, the Great American Cleanup is returning to Colorado Springs on Saturday, April 30th. There are many locations participating in the cleanup and we encourage members and their families or friends to choose a location that's best for them. So she provided uh, a link that um, you can go to and uh, that is in the newsletter. So no, I'm sorry, it's in the email that she sent out um, Thursday. Um, the next community service meeting will be on Thursday, April 21st at noon on Zoom. Um, if you're interested in joining, the link is also in that email that she sent out and, um, or you could just send an email to Samantha Chapman and she'll get you on the email notification list. So that's it for um, the community service stuff. Um, <clears throat> I have, um, Lynn Pearson would like to talk about uh, flight for a few minutes. Can somebody get her microphone please? Thanks, Jack. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know that the uh, flight uh, 2022 sponsor uh, information is available. So if anybody uh, is either interested in being a sponsor or could um, refer us to a contact at a business that you think would be a good sponsor, you could contact Tom Notton or myself. And um, the uh, details about the different sponsorship levels, as well as the commitment form, are available on the flight website, which is csflight.org. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Tina, <clears throat> can you tell us how, um, how soon the tickets for the event will be on the website available to buy, please? <clears throat> <laughs> You can go to uh, flight.givesmart.com and you can register yourself and then you're able to buy tickets. Um, they are $100 a piece and it's for um, appetizers, one drink and dinner at the boot barn and fun and, fun. and good music. And so uh, and the and, uh, flight, the auction is on September 24th. 
uh, flight.givesmart.com. Um, isn't that available also at csflight.org? So I think so. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little easier to remember, csflight.org. Yeah, okay, okay so go to csflight.org and you can uh, get to the link that way as well. Okay. And then Great. Mike McGrath is supposed to have it on the Club Runner as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. there is a there is a, <clears throat> an icon there at the top of the website, csrotary.org, um, where you can um, look up flight and get the information on that. But that, for those that are visiting, it's our biggest fundraiser of the year. Um, it's called Flight because we uh, commission local artists to create these big, huge metal butterfly and dragonfly structures, and then we auction those off. We also have tabletops, we call them petites, and those will be um, in the silent auction that will be available online before the event as well. So um, so if you're interested and you want more information, let me know before you leave today. <clears throat> well, we're a few minutes early, four minutes early, and I think um, I'm going to introduce Jody Ritchie to come up and um, and introduce our speaker today. Jody's the one that brought this speaker to me and I'm super excited about it. So thank you, Jody. Appreciate that. I love looking out over Rotary, downtown Colorado Springs, all these beautiful people. And I have to tell you, I haven't been here in two months or so, and I am so happy to be here. So our speaker today, Dr. Leon Kelly. You know, if you've met Dr. Kelly or you know anything about him, that's really all I need to say. For those of you who have never met him and don't know him, this is going to be an experience. And let me share just a couple of little tidbits about him. First of all, he is a nationally acclaimed expert in the fields of forensic pathology. Did you know that there are only 500 forensic pathologists in the entire United States? And he is at the top of that field. I know, isn't that amazing? It really is. Um, he's also an expert in toxicology, suicide and infant death prevention, child abuse, domestic violence, and strangulation investigations, just to name a few. So he has actually in his position, he has performed over 4,000 forensic autopsies. Over 60,000 death investigations have been performed under his leadership. He has testified in hundreds of criminal trials across the Rocky Mountain region and even more importantly, he has also appeared in 15 episodes of Homicide Hunter. L Lieutenant Joe Kenda. And if you don't know Homicide Hunter, you and I need to have a little chat. So on, on top of all of that, he also is a professor at UCCS. I just found that out today. It's amazing. On top of all that, he also directs Colorado's only in-house forensic toxicology laboratory. And then on top of that, on top of that, with, during COVID, he works so many extra hours every day to navigate us through that period. And I know there are a lot of people very grateful for him for that. And through all of that, all of that, all of that, all of that, he still makes time for his family, his beautiful wife, Heather, and their two great kids. So he always talks about his specialty is figuring out how and why people die. But I can tell you his passion is the living and finding out how and why people can thrive. Dr. Kelly. All right, thanks for, thank you for having me here today. Um, I am the coroner, which is always an awkward person to be invited to what should be a festive event. Um, and, and every time I get invited, they say, okay, we want you to come, but you know, make it funny and upbeat. And I, I remind them you are inviting the coroner, um, but I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, and so just to jump to the, to the chase here, I do a lot of these talks and I, I a lot of Q&As and I know what the questions are going to be and Jody reminded me of one of them earlier and a story she told. So just real quick, um, yes, it does stink. Uh, two, it's not at all like on TV. Um, three, yes, I, I agree that this is ridiculous that I have to get elected. And then four, most importantly, yes, I am going to see you naked. Um, <laughs> And, and I don't know why that's the, that's the worst part of it, but that's the thing that people are most fearful of. And I remind them, but if you're seeing me, like a horrible tragedy befell you, and they're like, yeah, but I, I want to know if I'm going to be naked. 
So I'm here to talk about um, not just what the corner is. I think all of us know what the corner does, right? I'm, I'm responsible for investigating sudden, unexpected, or, or violent deaths. So these are our suicides, our homicides, our car crashes, um, our mass shootings, um, kind of really the worst of the worst that happens uh, in our community. And so I'm not going to talk much about that today. Um, we, we get enough of that on the nightly news and in our lives. So I'm going to talk about today how we take things like that and turn them into meaningful, positive impacts in our community. Because as I always say, I've never, I've done, you know, approaching 5,000 autopsies in my career. And I have never once autopsied the dead person for the dead person. Like that's not the point of it. We don't do it for them. We do it because the things that we learn from that death give us the information and the tools to prevent those same things from happening to other people in the future, right? A hundred plus years ago when we invented cars, the first thing we did because we're humans is what? Crash them, right? And the job of the forensic pathologist a hundred plus years ago was to go, well, why did these people die, right? And we said, oh, they keep flying out of these cars and landing on their heads. And someone's like, what if we had like a strap or something that like held them in there? And then we're like, yeah, that's a pretty good idea. Let's try it. So we try that and guess what? They stop falling out, right? But then what happens? Well, they get into car crash and they're like, oh, that's good. They stay in the car, but now they keep smashing their head on a steering wheel, right? And the pathologist says that. And they say, okay, well, what if like, I don't know, like a balloon like blew up, like right before they hit the steering wheel and someone is like, that's so crazy. It just might work. And it does. And we've reduced motor vehicle fatalities by 50%, right? In the last several decades. So we do it because it gives us the ability to save lives, right? And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. So how's this going to work here? Oh, here we go. We got it. Aiming at this guy here, the laptop. Okay. Is this on wheels? This is kind of exciting. I've never had a podium on wheels. So all those of you who have been here a long time know this story, um, or you, you should know it. Beginning in uh, 2015, we saw a massive increase in our teen suicides. We were averaging about, you know, three to four teen suicides per year, maybe five or six on a bad year. And we skyrocketed to 14 and 14 teen suicides in the year of 20, 2015. And then over the next three years, we saw that, that, that escalation persist. Um, during our highest concentration, we had a three and a half month period in 2017 where we had 11 teens in their life. Right. Many of these were happening at the same schools, sometimes three and four teens dying who knew each other over a, a several months span. And those of you who were here and remember, this is we, we really truly were a community in crisis. We had parents panicked. Um, we had schools panicked. We had media panicked. We had uh, local leaders panicked. What are we going to do about this? And during that period, it obviously falls on the coroner as the person who's breaking the bad news of what's going on. That, uh, that this is an issue and that we need to deal with it. Now, you got to remember this was, you know, coming up not quite 10 years, but it's coming up on seven or eight years ago. And the culture was very different then. And there was a lot of pushback from other folks in the community as, as I and my colleagues were speaking out about what was going on. I had people tell me that, you know, other folks, we get it, but other folks are saying, you shouldn't talk about this, that this makes Colorado Springs look bad, right? And my response to them was, um, you know who that sounds like? That sounds like the mayor from Jaws, right? There's a shark eating kids and all you care about is the tourists. Why don't we take care of the shark and then the tourists will take care of themselves. And so we've tried not talking about this for thousands of years and how has that worked out for us? Not super great. So we're gonna try something different this time. And what we tried to do was talk go out and reach out to the community and, and let people understand what was happening. And this is, these are some of the headlines from that period. As a side, one of the, one of the, one of the things that sucks about being the coroner, there's a lot to be honest with you, but one of the things that sucks is you get interviewed a lot and you get in the newspaper a lot, um, but you're never invited to talk about something good. You're only invited to talk about terrible things. And so when you get your picture taken, you're never allowed to smile because nobody wants a picture of a smiling coroner and a story about tragedy. So th this is my picture from, from, from Newsweek. So I get to be in Newsweek, but it's for a horrible reason and I have to have a very, very sad picture. But we're at this point being called the teen suicide capital of America, which nobody wants that title for so many reasons. And so 
the beauty of this, though, is that at about this time, right before it, I was a governor-appointed position to the state child fatality review team. And every kid that died in Colorado, that case was reviewed by a team of experts, medical examiners, um, law enforcement, DHS, pediatricians, like everybody who would be involved in, 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 in the care of our young people. And the purpose of those reviews were to find gaps, find issues, find where things failed, like where we failed, and then to find um, intervention strategies or intervening points where we could prevent those same things from happening to other people. The problem with that was it was all done in Denver. So we all go up there and we would meet once a month and do this. Well, it was thought at the time, and I agreed with this, that if we're going to make change in a community, if we're going to find out what's happening there and then have the, the boots on the ground people to talk about it, figure out what went wrong, and then deploy those intervention strategies, it needs to be done in that community. And so what we did was there was a bill that passed. Um, at the end of 2013, that essentially pushed that intervention, that was reviews from the state level down to the local level, what we call regional child fatality review teams. And I, I agreed with that. And so that's what happened. And so right at about 2014, every single county in the state had to convene a, a child fatality review team. And so me and my po colleagues at Public Health did exactly that. Um, we met and we decided who was going to be on this team and we invited them and we created what we felt were the, the best, smartest, most dedicated people in the room to do something about child deaths. Um, fortunately and unfortunately, as the, about the point that this team was hitting the ground, we were making national news for teen suicide. The good news is, is we had the people in place now to address this, to figure out what was happening. And so that's what we did. What it, what it required, though, was a completely different shift in what many of us felt our roles were historically. And I can certainly talk about the role of the coroner. And what the coroner has been doing for, you know, several hundred years is somebody dies, you investigate it. The second you figure out how and why they're dead, you move on to the next death. Okay. But in this particular case, that wasn't good enough. It wasn't just good enough to know, yeah, they did this to themselves. We needed to know why. And so what I did was I developed a, a, what we called a, the child self-injury tool, which was an investigative uh, tool form, essentially, that went into every aspect of these kids' lives. You know, who, who, who were they? What were their connections? You know, what were their lives like? What were their friends like? All of the things that make up this human being with, for the purpose of identifying where things were failing. What were the risk factors that were going to this? What, we, what could we identify as a child at, at increased risk? And, and ultimately, why are we here? What is the point of all of this? Like, why are we autopsying these kids and these adults if we're not going to turn around and do something about it? And so it really, it really altered my role in the community at that point. Next, data, right? You can't solve a problem, any problem, without first identifying what it is, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are. That's where everything begins. If you're not honest about where you're failing, you're never going to improve. And so that's what we did uh, through that child self-injury toolkit. We needed to provide that answer of what was happening, what's changed, what's different about this generation that we hadn't seen previously. And then actionable items. We all know the problems with government and bureaucracy. And if you died in the old system, if you died on January 1st, that child's death would be reviewed the following year. So if you died on January of this year, 2022, that death would be reviewed by that team in Denver the following year at some point. They compile that data for the 2021 data during 2022, and they submit it to the state by the end of 2020, what would be now 2023, okay? And then the state has six months to turn around and compile the data and, and spit the information back out in the summer of 2024. So if you died three months ago and somebody asked me what happened, I can say I'll get around to it about middle of 2024, right? That is not acceptable. And we had too much happening here that did not allow for that kind of time. We needed to know today what was happening. And so we reviewed all that at the local level and we were able to spit that information out immediately as we were compiling. And then third, putting this into action. And we all know this was COVID. This is true of any real organization, any real community-wide issue is we never accomplish anything in the room by ourselves, right? The only way you make meaningful impacts is by bringing partners to the table who haven't had a say before, right? The only way that you actually change the culture is by inviting the culture in to have a conversation. And so what we did was, 
we got to the point where I'm like, I am not going to sit around a room with public health and law enforcement and have one more conversation about teen suicide. Until we get the people in here who can do something about it, there's no point. And so what we did was me and Susan Whelan, who's now the current director of the public health department, we were both deputies at the time. I wasn't the coroner. We went to the old Montagues and we sat down and we said, we know what the problem is. We've got the data. Okay, we know where the issues are. What are we going to do about it? And we, on the back of napkins, drew up in our minds what the, what the dream scenario was for, for intervening here. No limits, no constraints, outside the box, reinvent it from the, from the bottom up. And we did that. And then we did what every single great leader in history has done. You turn around and hand that off to people who know what the hell they're doing. Um, and then you get out of their way, right? You say, this is my vision. It's a pipe dream. Sorry. Um, and then they figure it out. And, and what, that's what happened. Our local community did. So we brought every single youth-facing organization to the table. Everything from our faith-based community to inside out, to our schools, to our doctors, uh, to our um, nonprofits, to every single person, every single agency, government, private, public, um, to the table to talk about what we were going to do. And we identified those gaps, we identified those issues, and then we deployed those through what we called the Teen Suicide Prevention Working Group. And that's what it looked like. It was 60 partner agencies. These are government. These are nonprofits. These are the, the, big, the big hitters in the community. But then we also invited the community in as well. Parents of, of, that lost children to suicide. What better lived experience do we have than that? We invited youth to the table to talk about their experiences, what was happening. Every conceivable group were there. And then we got to work. And during that, what did we accomplish? Well, uh, we accomplished one, a space where we could have these conversations, uh, where we could address what we were missing and, and what we needed to really develop a community-wide in the truest sense uh, solution to this. We partnered with numerous agencies, including um, our wonderful Pikes Peak Suicide Prevention, which we have here, who then did teen think tanks. They invited about 150 kids into the room, and they said, you know, we're a bunch of 30, 40, and 50-year-olds in this room talking about what teens need, right? You know what teens need. You're living this life. We didn't live it. I graduated high school in 1995. We didn't have the internet. You know, we didn't have any of these things that these kids are dealing with, so we need to hear from them. Uh, we advocated for additional resources to these many groups. We weren't the only community dealing with this. We had several in Colorado. Um, Colorado always ranks towards the top in suicide rates. Uh, unfortunately, the entire Rocky Mountain does from essentially top to bottom. And so this wasn't necessarily new to us, high suicide rates, but this particular group was very new to us. And so we uh, partnered with the Attorney General's office who found us a lot of funding, and we were able to share this data, what we were finding between the think tanks and the, the, the focus groups between some of these other counties that, you know, maybe had Mesa County is a very different environment than ours and some of these other places. We trained our local PIOs, our public information officers for the schools. We were having suicides you know, in the morning, and now they're, they don't know, how do you tell a school of a thousand kids that one of their classmates is dead? What's the appropriate way to handle that when now hundreds of parents are calling panicked? What do we do when the media now wants to know? And what do you do when you want kids who want to celebrate the, this life, but you don't, want to, you don't want to glorify it? You don't want to turn this kid into a folk hero, but yet you want to wrap your arms around this family, all right? Postvention is prevention. The best thing we can do in these scenarios is help the kids that are exposed so that we don't have another one, which is what we were experiencing. Connected to other local agencies um, for funding and training, um, evidence-based programs that build resiliency upstreams. We, in this country, we have dealt with, with suicide prevention largely as a crisis intervention. We wait till they're on the ledge and then we do something about it, okay? And that's important. We need crisis intervention. But what changes things are upstream. That's like if, you know, 150 years ago when whole cities burned to the ground during fires, right? San Francisco burns, Chicago burns, all these communities burn. What did we do, right? You work upstream. You prevent the fires from happening in the first place. You teach people what to do when things go wrong, right? That's not how we've ever dealt with mental health. Okay. And so what we needed to do was, to me, that's like, if the only way you decided to deal with fires is you just bought more of those trampolines and those clown firemen that run around and catch people falling out of buildings, 
right? That's insane, but that's how we do it. We make more hotlines for people to call, right? And so what we needed to do was work upstream with kids, give kids the tools to deal with the challenges of their life because they're going to come. And then lastly, some things you don't even anticipate are going to happen. And one of the things we discovered was that Colorado Springs Police Department has what we call the crisis response team or the co-responder model, where if you are someone in an acute mental health crisis, you're freaking out, you're, you're a danger to yourself and your family, you're agitated, um, the call comes in and dispatch recognizes what's happening. They say, this sounds like a mental health issue. So they send out a police officer and they send out a trained behavioral health, health therapist. They come to the home. The, the cop makes sure everybody's safe and there's no danger. And then the therapist then assesses the person, starts to counsel them, makes sure that they're in an okay place, get them the resources they need. If they need to go to a hospital or a clinic, that's where they go. Okay, that's the way it should work. Unfortunately, not everybody has that. And what we discovered was the sheriff's office didn't. So if you were on one side of the street, you went to UC Health and got the mental health care that you need. If you're on the other side of the street, you went to jail. So what we were able to do then was get the grant funding to create that same model on the other side of the street for the sheriff's office. And it has been massively successful. That benefits everyone. People get the help they need. They don't belong in jail. It decreases who is in jail. And it's really what law enforcement policing is about, about making us all safer and better. All right, so what did we learn? Key factors. One, these are the things that we look at as risks for kids. And a lot of these obviously transition to adults, but things, some things are different. One, mental health disorders, obviously. If you've got a serious mental illness, you're at high risk of suicide attempt. Social media and cyberbullying. We have a generation that's been raised with all external self-worth, right? It's not relationships. It's not sitting in a room with a friend and talking to them. It's, it's positive or negative reinforcement at all times. And the positive feels good, right? All of us in this room who are public figures um, know what it's like to get pummeled <laughs> online. Um, and so, but there were adults who are fully functioning or successful in our lives. Imagine if you're a 12 or 13 year old kid who doesn't have a sense of self yet, right? Who hasn't overcome these things. Um, lack of pro-social activities. We've got a generation that doesn't do the same things. And I don't want to be like, ah, these kids these days, but you know, in our days, what did we do? We got home from school. We went out. We met our friends. We played. We, we self-regulated. We self-led, um, right? And that's not what we see today. We don't have kids who necessarily have those meaningful connections out there in the world. Biggest thing, lack of connection to a caring adult family or family discord. That was the number one underlying issue. It's families. It's, it's kids who had an unstable support system at home, you know, divorce, drugs, legal issues. They did not have a respite, a, a safe harbor to go to when the inevitable challenges of life come. A judgment and lack of acceptance in the community, whatever that community is, whether it's friends or school or family, um, substance use, mental disorders, and trauma history with the lack of availability of behavioral health. Kids have gone through things who aren't, don't have access to people who can help them. Exposure to adult suicide. We know people who are exposed to suicide have a great, much greater risk of dying due to suicide or attempting, or substance abuse, which always plays a big role. Adverse childhood events, what we call the ACE, the ACE scores. How many of these negative experiences have you had in your life? And then loss of, of relationships, okay? Um, deaths in the family, deaths of friends, which is obviously an issue with suicide. And so what we saw here was, um, these are the issues that go into it. When we look at these, you can imagine how all kids face many of these, but there are certain groups that face these more than others. And those would be our LGBTQ community, our foster kids, and our homeless teens. They have many of these risk factors, which is why you often hear with suicidality, suicide prevention is those are the groups often that we focus on all kids, but those are the groups that we are most concerned about. So what are we going to do? These are the actions, prioritize relationships, building between youth and adults, mentorship. Every, every meaningful relationship between an adult and a child is like a tether point, right? And the more of those you have, the more able they are to withstand the storms that come. Uh, create culture supportive of youth in crisis and post-crisis. Be a person that says, look, you're going to screw up. <laughs> like We all screw up we're ki when, when we're kids, but we're going to be there for you, and we're going to help you through it. Programs that build resiliency and coping skills. We talked about sources of strength and some others that are in, in school programs. Increase ac access to pro-social environments, everything. 
youth groups, church groups, sports, culture, arts. I'm a big supporter of the, of the auditorium initiative because it's a central hub for culture and for kids that don't necessarily have access or a way to express themselves. The arts are critical for that for many kids. Sports are critical for that for other kids. Fund primary suicide prevention programs, which we have in this community, destigmatize mental health seeking. We are living in a period where every piece of data we have says teen suicide, our teen depression, anxiety, mental health disorders are going up. Okay. And yet, and here's the good news of this, we were averaging 14 teen suicides a year. Last year we had four. Okay. And we had four on the back end of a pandemic, which isolated kids even more, right? So when you have incidents of mental health issues going up, incidents of any disease going up, but your worst outcomes are going down, what does that tell you? Your interventions are working, right? You're, you're finding success there. Foster youth uh, provider access. We need more people who are willing to care for kids peer to peer while well, family support things like NAMI. I'm the board chair of NAMI. That's huge in our community. We need to force multipliers, which are essentially peer to peer. It's people who've been through it who can help those who are not in that place yet. And then media training and mental health first aid. If you own an organization or run an organization, a church, a business, there are a few things more impactful than you can do than sign your staff or your agency or your organization up for mental health first aid. It teaches you the same things that everybody else learns for regular first aid. You know how to, you know, if you see somebody struggling, right, you know the easy things to do to help them. And if that's too much, you know the right people to call, right? That's what first aid is. And so this is me. This is one of the few smiling pictures you'll ever see. And, uh, and I'm smiling because um, this, was, this was last fall, but I got a call last summer um, from a voicemail from the governor of Wyoming's office. And it left the voicemail and I said, we're, we're trying to get a hold of Dr. Kelly. And I, I listened to him, I'm like, what in the hell does the governor of Wyoming want with me? I'm like, unless he's been murdered and they need someone to come like help them, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do here. Um, and so I called him back mostly out of curiosity. And I'm like, I think you got the wrong guy. And like, no, no, you're the one we're looking for. Um, we heard you on Colorado Public Radio talking about the success that you guys had in El Paso County with your teen suicides. Wyoming uh, leads the nation in suicide rates. And the governor of Wyoming feels that that represents an existential threat to their economy, their ability to recruit businesses and recruit and, re and retain a healthy, robust workforce, okay? So he invited me to come up and speak at the Wyoming's Business Alliance, right? And I'm like, you do know I'm the coroner, right? And they said, yeah, we know. That's why we're bringing you. We want you to talk to the oil companies, the natural gas companies, the rancher, you know, folks. These are the people we need to get on board with this because it's their workers and it's their business and their industries that are going to suffer, that are suffering because of this. So they put together this amazing panel at a business conference, a panel of experts on suicide. And so, that's the lessons learned, right? This is a success story. But, you know, there's always a part two, right? If, if the first one's good, you know, they're coming for another one. And we are facing several tremendous challenges. The first being fentanyl. We had yesterday, I don't know if any of you saw it, we had a massive um, press conference with the DEA, the FBI, the state attorney, our district attorney, myself, or both of our law enforcement. Um, we, five years ago, in 2017, we had five total fentanyl deaths in El Paso County, five. Every year since then, it's doubled. Last year, we had 101 fentanyl-related deaths, okay? Last year, five of those were kids, a one-and-a-half-year-old, a, a five-year-old, a 15-year-old who died at school of a drug overdose, and then two 17-year-olds. This is a nationwide crisis that has been really 20 years in the making. And to solve it and to address it is going to take the same type of collaborative that we've successfully done in this community in the past. You can't fix a problem that impacts everybody without having everybody at the table to, to deal with it. And then secondly, veteran suicide. We have an incredible veteran culture and community here. And we know the challenges that those groups have with suicide. What we have been able to do is based on the teen suicide work that we did, I then almost immediately adapted it to adults and we started asking those same questions of adults. And so I've got now, you know, four plus years of really robust adult data. The Office of Behavioral Health was looking for a community to invest millions of dollars in over multiple years to address veteran suicide. 
and for the first time, really provide full wraparound community-wide service to them. Not just a therapist, not just a hotline, but every single thing across the board that they would need. Not only for them, and this is the biggest part, for their family. Because the most important person beyond the person suffering of mental illness that's going to be critical in their success is the people surrounding them. But nobody ever thinks to support them. All the work, all the stress, all the pain, all the suffering falls on them because they're the ones that are going to have to help take care of them, right? And so that's what this program does. Because of the relationship that my office and others had, um, UC Health was able to apply for this grant and, and won it. And so that money, I think it's like $9 million is staying here. And so you will see over the next month, um, they're deploying that. There's going to be a portal that every single veteran is going to be able to go to one website, click a button, put their name in, and then they will be reached out for help. It's really the first of its kind anywhere in this country. The goal is, is that it will be successful, that we will show meaningful impact, just like we did with teens. And then that same program will then be deployed in other communities across the country, potentially saving countless, countless veterans' lives. Okay, So nah, these are big topics, I know, I'm sorry. But, um, but the struggles that we've had and the challenges that we've succeeded and pushed through are, are now on the precipice of giving us the opportunity to really make true impact in, the, in, 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 in things that honestly we haven't been able to address for decades. And so I am incredibly hopeful, right? We don't do the autopsy for the dead, we do them for the living, and this is our best chance in a very long time to make tremendous change here. So I am happy that you guys invited me. I thank you very much and happy to take questions. Yes. Oh, yeah. Zoomers. Oh, hello. Okay. Maybe on the on the lighter side, maybe yes. you've got a story for us of of a uh, Darwin Award, hold my beer kind of fatality that you've uh, had to do an autopsy for. Yeah, I can I can give you one of those. I can give you one of my favorite stories of all time is um, uh, I was in Dallas, Texas, and uh, and there was a, there was an older woman, and she was the the she was the wife of a of kind of an old oil money. And she had gone, the family couldn't get a hold of her. The, the, the real the estate attorney couldn't get a hold of her. He had some papers for her to sign. So she, uh, he comes to the house and um, is looking around. And something doesn't seem right. The, one of the grandsons was supposed to be taking care of her. And the family wasn't real uh, attentive. And he starts looking around. He looks in the window. He sees the whole house is ransacked. There's stuff everywhere. And so he um, calls police, welfare check, you know, come in, they find her deceased. She's completely skeletonized, full skeleton on a couch in the back room. Maggots and um, in um, pupa casings, the little, basically the cocoon of the fly is, is everywhere, millions of them. And the grandson's missing. We don't know where he is. And so I do the autopsy on her. Can't figure out why she's dead because she's a skeleton. I end up identifying her based on radiology. We don't know what happened. We assume she died of old age and the son was, the grandson was essentially using it as a drug house uh, with him and his friends. And so about two months later, I get a call from the cop, the homicide detective who was in charge of it. And he says, hey, I found the grandson. I said, great, where is he? He's like, oh, he's in the hospital. I said, what does he say happened to his grandmother? He's like, well, he can't talk. He's, he's in the ICU. I said, well, what's wrong with him? He's like, well, it's the darndest thing that the doctor said they'd never seen anything like it. And I said, well, what does they say he has? And he said, well, they say he has this thing called Morgellons disease. Does anyone know what Morgellons disease is? All right. And I start laughing. And he's like, why are you laughing? And I'm like, do you know what Morgellons is? He's like, I'm, not, I'm a cop. I have no idea what Morgellons disease is. I go, Morgellons disease isn't a disease. It's a psychological manifestation where they, they believe that there are fibers or bugs under their skin. And, and drug addicts and people who are psychotic will experience it. And then they pick at it, which then gets infected, which then reinforces the belief that there are bugs under their skin. And they said, well, well yeah, but they say that these maggots keep hatching out of all these wounds. And then I go, this is amazing. He's like, why? I go, do you know why all those maggots are hanging, ha hatching out of his wounds? He goes, no. I said, because grandma died. All the flies laid eggs in her. Maggots were hatched. The flies grew up. They flew around. They laid eggs in him because he's in there in the house using drugs, using out a drug house. And now he's sick and dying. I go, if that guy dies, it's really like the ghost of grandma 
coming back from the grave to seek revenge on her grandson. I'm like, that's the most beautiful Edgar Allan Poe story that exists. And so be, be, be kind to your grandmother, please. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, it's 1.30, so um, he can stay a little longer. Okay. Every time has been excellent, but I thank you for your proactive initiatives to solve these major suicide problems. And um, I know you're running for a re-election, and you brought up the point that the law does not provide, prescribe any, requ any uh, professional requirements for this. And I know you've got at least a couple opponents, and I look at their credentials, and I say, my gosh, why would anybody <laughs> vote for those people? So for you here, I would just say, does this guy have credentials? Amen. And yes. So, so thank you very much, Dr. Kelly. <laughs> I have gifts for you, so <laughs> thank you. Okay, I have a certificate for you. Thank you so oh, much for presenting you. to us. And I suppose you oh, need yes. to stay awake. Thank <laughs> you, I appreciate it. All right, thank you guys so much and have a great week.